everyone. Welcome back to the Data Science and Analytics track. I'm Maya Soren. It's really good to not see you at all and feel like I'm talking into the void. I hope you're all having a great time. Uh, let's just jump straight into it. Uh, we've got Simon Willison coming up next as the first in our very last block of the day, talking about building your own data warehouse for personal analytics with SQLite and Dataset. Uh, pronounces Dataset. Uh, now, Simon created Dataset, uh, which is an open source tool for exploring and publishing data while he was working at The Guardian UK. You might have also heard his name associated with having created Django at some stage. I don't know. I'm, I'm not really sure that that's anything interesting. Anyway, Simon, over to you. Good afternoon, uh, PyCon. So yeah, I'm going to spend the next 20 minutes talking about how you can build your own data warehouse for personal analytics. Um, just a quick note, uh, I'm going to be taking Q&A by, I'll uh, save some time Q&A at the end. Um, please post your questions in this shared Google Doc. You've got the link, the link's up on my screen as well. Um, fill this in with questions as we go along, and I'll expand this out with notes and things after the session too. Um, so this talk is mainly an excuse for me to talk about my latest open source project. This is a project called Dataset that I've been working on for just under three years now. And it's a tool that aims to take that idea of a big expensive data warehouse and make it small and cheap. Um, data, there is so much data out there about us and our companies and our lives. And I feel like really um, there aren't enough tools for, for digging into that and, 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 and using that and, and, and and, and analyzing and sharing um, sharing that data with people. So the best way to explain Dataset is with a demo. This is a this is Dataset, it's a web application up and running. Um, I set this up a little while ago. This is a data set of the register of members' interests for the UK government. So in the UK are members of parliament, um, anytime they receive a gift from somebody, they have to report that. And this is all of the latest reports that those MPs have put in. And you can see there's one and a half million uh, reports in rows in here. These MPs get a lot of gifts. My favorite thing to do is to search for hamper because it turns out that Christmas hampers are very generously handed out. Boris Johnson got a 350 pound hamper this year, a 750 pound hamper um, earlier on. And um, you often find that the, the, the Saudi Arabian embassy likes dishing out Christmas hampers, which I always think is, is kind of interesting. Um, but I have a more relevant demo for an Australian audience. Um, the data.gov.au published this wonderful CSV file that's a file of every public toilet in Australia, all 19,000 of them. And so I've loaded those into Dataset. Um, Dataset has a plugin mechanism where you can write plugins for it. And so I have a plugin which looks for latitude and longitude columns. And if it finds them, it puts the data on a map. So for free, I get this map of all of these toilets in Australia. And I can actually load all like 19,000 points onto the map and browsers are fast these days, so that just works. So I can zoom in and explore them. Or I can take advantage of facets. Um, dataset facets work a little bit like pivot tables in Excel. So I can say things like facet by toilet type and instantly I see, oh look, there's um, 511 pit toilets in Australia. So I'm going to click in on those. I can say, let's facet by facility type. Now I'm seeing that there are, there are of those, there are 101 at camping grounds. If I click on that, I get a map of the 101 pit toilets on camping grounds in Australia. And anything a data set can be exported out as JSON if you want to do things programmatically with it, or you can pull it out as CSV if you want to load it back into Excel or anything like that. But you can also, um, everything here is built on top of SQL. So you can click view and edit SQL to see the SQL query that was run to pull back this list of toilets. And I can actually edit the SQL query and re-execute it because Every database and dataset is read-only. You can't cause any damage. So SQL injection, which is normally a really severe security hole, becomes a documented feature of the package. Lets you compose all kinds of SQL queries for your own analysis. Um, so that's um, dataset sort of as a way of publishing data. Like um, I, I, as mentioned, the idea for this comes from work I did at The Guardian many years ago. And I've been working with journalists and trying to figure out, okay, can we use this to to publish data about the world. But there's something really interesting about this just from a personal point of view as well. I should mention that the secret source behind Dataset is this open source database called SQLite. Um, it's 
tiny, it's crazy fast, it's really robust, and more, and it's absolutely everywhere. Um, SQLite runs on my iPhone, it runs on my laptop, it runs on my watch, as far as I can tell, and it's used by huge, array, huge arrays of different software. So a fun trick I can do is I can run this command right here to search my Mac for the largest SQLite files. So I could run this, it uses Spotlight, so it's instant. I can straight away see I've got like a 856 megabyte photos.sqlite um, database here, which is part of the, uh, the Apple Photos library, um, which is kind of interesting. So I'm gonna run dataset by typing dataset and giving it the link to that, that um, file. I have to put that in quotes. Um, this spins up a little, little local web server. And so now I'm looking at my Apple Photos and when you look through this, there are some suspiciously interesting tables. ZCloud Master Media Metadata has 44,000 rows in it. I can click through to that. And um, the data's kind of garbled, but there's a little clue here. It says BP list 00 in that column. So I've, I've written a dataset plugin called um, dataset hyphen BP list, which knows what to do with those columns. I can install it by typing dataset install dataset P list, run dataset again. And now when I refresh this page, that data is decoded and you can see that this is the full detailed metadata about every one of my photographs, including what lens I used and all of this stuff. And it's also got um, GPS information, like the, the latitude and longitude I was at when I took that picture. That's super interesting. We will absolutely be coming back to that later on. Um, so really though the inspiration for what i want to show you talk, talk about today was this essay written by posted by stephen wolfram um a year and a half ago stephen wolfram is a fascinating individual he makes elon musk look like he he, he doesn't really have much of an ego like wolfram it, i cannot recommend reading this essay enough if only for the scroll bar as you scroll through this essay about his approach to productivity and realize that this thing is, is, is practically a book, and he talks about how he's the CEO of a, com of a thousand person company, but he's a remote CEO. He's been running this company from home for 28 years, and he, every, every moment of that time he spent optimizing his working environment with standing desks and um, figuring out how to take his laptop for walks because his heart rate monitor said that was better for him. And he's like scanned all of his documents, and he built a... Um, he built a green screen setup studio in his basement so he could give talks from home. There is so much in here. It is so completely over the top. But there was one little bit of this that really caught, caught my fancy. He talks about how he has this thing that he calls a meta searcher. It's a search engine that, he's, that's just, that, that he built just for himself. And it searches every email he's ever sent, every book he's written, every paper, every person he's met, every, everywhere he's ever been, all in one place. And I thought, you know what? I might not need a basement studio, but having a search engine for all of my stuff sounds kind of great. So I decided I was gonna build it. And then of course, the thing that I needed was a name. And I figured, well, if I'm building something which is inspired by Stephen Wolf Graham, but it's not as good, maybe I should call it Dog Sheep. And I'll be honest, I liked that pun so much that I've spent the last year building software just to, just to, to justify the pun name. So I'm gonna dive straight in and show you my dog sheet. This is a personal data set instance, only available to me. It's authenticated and locked up behind client certificates and such like. And in this, I've been loading as much data as I can get access to about my life and work. So I've got data from Twitter and GitHub and Swarm, search history, and I've got Goodreads data, all of this different stuff. And partly this is useful as a way for me to exercise my dataset software. So many features in dataset have come out of me using this. But also, you know, as a sort of pack rat nerd, this is so much fun. There is so much interesting data that I, uh, out there that I can, I can get access to. So I'll show you a few examples. I've loaded in every commit to every one of my projects on GitHub. And that means that, you know, I can see all of these commits and search them and look at who's made the most contributions and all of those kinds of things. Um, but more importantly, I can co construct custom SQL queries. So this is a query which groups my, which, which truncates down to the day and groups by, and then uses another plugin I wrote called Dataset Vega that does charting. So this is a graph of my commit history over time. Um, this is, uh, so GitHub have this fabulous feature where 
they sh can show you which repositories depend on your repositories. And so I've been scraping that into a database as well. And I have this view that shows me that a couple of days ago, um, a new a, a new repo popped up on GitHub called Microcosm, which is using Dataset, which I haven't actually looked at, but I should look at that later. I've got all of my Twitter activity, and that's not just my tweets, but it's every tweet that I've favorited, everyone who follows me, everyone that I follow. So I can do things like search my favorites and see here are the 283 tweets that I've favorited that mention Dataset. And anyone who's used Twitter favorites will want this feature. If you suck all of that data down yourself, you can, you can do, do exactly that. A much more useful example, though, uh, my dog, Cleo, has a Twitter account. And every time she goes to the vet, she tweets a selfie and she tweets how much she weighs. She says, I weigh 42.3 pounds. I grew more dog. And so because I've now got that in a SQL database, I can construct a SQL query that uses a regular expression to extract her weight, the thing ending in pounds, and puts that in a table. And then I can use my charting thing to plot Cleo's weight over time. So this is her self-reported weight from going to the vet. And you can see that like most of the rest of us, she started to pack on pounds at the beginning of the pandemic and is still going up at the moment. Um, Another super useful example, I use um, Foursquare Swarm and I check in to places that I go. I've got that data back out again so I can see all of my check-ins. And every time I check in somewhere with Clio, I use the wolf emoji in the check-in message, which means I can run another SQL query which uses a where shout like wolf emoji because it turns out you can use emojis in SQL these days. And it gives me back a table of her check-ins with a latitude and longitude, which means that I can plot a map of everywhere that my dog likes to go. So this is Cleo's own personal map of places that she likes to visit in the Bay Area, which I'm sure you can agree is, is a crazy useful thing to have. Um, let's be even more useful. Um, I did 23andMe, the thing where you send off a swab and they, they decode your DNA and then send you increasingly terrifying emails about missing relatives and genetic diseases you might have. Um, and then I realized that they have an export button. You can export your genome back out of them. And when you do that, they give you a CSV file with 600,000 rows in it. So I've loaded that into my personal data set. And I've got a query, that I, a SQL query I can run that tells me what color my eyes are based on my own genome. So apparently my eyes are blue 99% of the time. This took an entire weekend and I, I, I had to, to, to borrow a geneticist to figure this out, but it's obviously a crazy useful thing for my software to be able to do. Um, another useful example, um, this one is a little bit more useful. Uh, so I use an Apple Watch and it tracks my location and the energy I've burned and my sleep cycles and all of this stuff. And to Apple's credit, it doesn't upload that to the cloud. It keeps it on the watch and on my phone and they give me an export button. You can click export and get out a zip file full of XML um, with all of this stuff in. So I've loaded this in and it is terrifying how much stuff I have in here. They know my stairs, flights that I climbed, headphone audio exposure showed up recently, sleep analysis. Um, there's one in here, mindful sessions. It turns out I've only done one mindful session. I am not a very mindful person. Um, but the really fun stuff in here is workouts. So every time you do a workout on the Apple Watch, Apple record the, it records your GPS location every few seconds, and that data is available to you. Um, I ran Beta Breakers, a race in San Francisco, like three years ago, and I can click load all and load my exact progression through that race onto a map and um, see my, my course speed and all of these kinds of things. I love that this is something that we can do now. I think this is really exciting. So that's genomes. Um, I've got one last demo in here, which is pretty fun. Um, I showed you that Apple Photos database earlier, and I figured out, I finally figured out how to get the data out in a format that was useful to me. And I realized that um, Apple do this really interesting thing with your photos where they run, a, um, they run a machine learning model on your phone to figure out what's in the pictures that you've taken. So this is literally running on your phone overnight. It's saying, oh, that's a dog and that's a cat and that's a pelican. And I managed to get that data back out again, which means I now have my own search engine where I can search for Pelican and see all of the photos that I have taken of Pelicans according to Apple's machine learning, um, um, machine learning stuff. That's cool, but what's even cooler is it turns out they have a, they calculate scores for your photographs on your device for how good they are. And they don't tell you that they're doing this, but there are columns in that database for things like Z overall aesthetic score and Z harmonious color score and Z pleasant camera tilt score. 
And so this right here isn't just photos of pelicans. These are photos of the pelicans that are most aesthetically pleasing according to Apple's machine learning model. And that's super, super fun. I love that I can do that. So all of the stuff that I've shown you is aggressively open source. Um, datasets open source. All of these dog sheep tools, um, which are things for taking data from these different sources and then putting them in SQLite so you can run them with data. These are all, all open source as well. Um, there is some assembly required. You need to get API keys for different services. I'm running a server with a cron that, on it that's constantly running these things to fetch new data. Um, but it's all available for you to start using. And then the last thing I wanted to show you, this is brand new. I finally got this working five hours ago. And it's really the sort of end goal of all of this is I wanted this search engine. I wanted that search engine across all of my stuff. And so I've built it. And I called it Dog Sheep Beta because Stephen Wolfram has a search engine called Wolfram Alpha. So I figured Dog Sheep Beta was absolutely the appropriate name for this. And so this thing has... I got, just set this up, it's got 193,000 things in it. It's got tweets and blog entries and issue comments and commits and photos I've taken and all of this stuff. And I can now run searches. So if I search, for example, for dog costumes, actually, no, Cleopause costume is better. I can see every time my dog, whose Twitter name is Cleopause, has tweeted about one of her costumes. And here we are, that's, that's, this is a, she won best costume at Dogfest a few years ago for dressing up as the Golden Gate Bridge which is pretty fabulous. That's her dressed as a pirate. Um, and I can search for PyCon. Oh, I can search for Quoll. I love Australian wildlife is the best. I've got a whole bunch of tweets that I favorited um, with pictures of Quolls in. There's, this is a, I, I am so, so excited about this thing because it, it finally gives me that ability that I've wanted to tie all of this data together and, and see it all in one place. Um, I'll be writing more about Dogsheet Beta literally in the next couple of days because I just, just finished it. But again, it's open source. It's ready for you to try it out if you want to. And I think I should move to Q&A because we, we started a little bit late. So yeah, I'm going to move to questions. Um, first question is, what's the cutest costume your dog has worn? Um, I've already shown you that. I think it's the Golden Gate Bridge, although she was kind of cute as a pirate as well. Um, next question. Um, yes, so. Is your data from a JSON source that you need to convert to SQLite? So the way I've been doing this is I wrote a Python library called SQLite Utils, which is a couple of things. It's a command line tool that you can pipe CSV or JSON directly into, and it'll turn that into a SQLite database. But more importantly, it's a Python library with functions in that will create the database table for you based on the data you feed it. So I did not come up with a schema for GitHub and Swarm and Twitter and photos and all of that junk, because that would have taken me ages. I literally write code that turns it into a list of, of JSON objects, and I splat that to SQLite, and, my, and this, this library creates the table schema for me. And that, I found, is a really productive way of working. So pretty much all of the dog sheep tools, if you look at them, if you look at the source code, they're actually getting data from JSON APIs, sometimes from XML, and splatting it to SQLite using this library. Um, is there support for styling the dataset interface? There absolutely is. Dataset has, um, custom, you can use custom templates, you can use custom CSS. I don't have many examples of that running, but um, the Baltimore Sun newspaper used it to publish public salary records of everyone in the state of Maryland. And this is actually data set, but they styled it to, to use their color scheme and so on. So yeah, you can absolutely style it. Um, uh, are there any other alternatives considered to cron? Um, cron is great. Cron just works. I am, however, thinking about doing a sort of database-backed alternative to cron just so I can do things like look at a page that shows me here are the tasks that are scheduled to run in the future, here are tasks that are overdue. I think for doing this on a much larger scale, that might make sense, but at the moment, cron's been working great. Can you extract Google Photos data in a similar way to Apple Photos? Oh, good Lord, this is so frustrating. Google Photos... They have an API and you can get stuff out in JSON, but they deliberately don't give you the latitude and longitude of your photos. I think because it's a privacy violation, but that's the thing I care about the most. So I spent months trying to build this stuff on top of Google Photos and eventually realized that the best way to do this was the Apple Photos thing. And I have a script that runs on my laptop, pulls out all of the data and then publishes it that way because it was the only way I could get it to do it. Um, do I plan to steal Palantir's market share? Absolutely not. But I don't think they're going after data journalists and um, homebrew nerds who want to do a map of all of their workouts. So I think they, they can keep the 
they can keep the big data creepy end of the market. I'm concentrating on, on the smaller stuff. Um, other plans to make the source database interchangeable. I've gone back and forth on this. I wrote a script called um, DB to SQLite. Um, and what that one does is it, um, you can give it any, a connection string to like MySQL or Postgres, and it will suck down all the data, turn it into SQLite, um, and let you run data set that way. Um, I actually run that on my cron, I, my blog is Postgres on Heroku. I suck that down into a SQLite database, I think once an hour, and it's fast and it works. But I did do a little spike a while ago to see if I could get it working with Postgres, because that would solve the big data problem. You know, there are things, there are, there are big data warehouse things that are Postgres compatible. It's definitely possible. I'm really nervous about committing to it because then I'm committing to maintaining a database abstraction layer and that's a lot of work. So I wouldn't rule it out, but it's not on the roadmap at the moment. Um, has having control about your data like that changed your perspective on privacy or the way that others aggregate data? It hasn't, but only because I already sort of knew what was going on. Um, I think one of the things that I find really interesting is that the, the European GDPR law that came into effect a couple of years ago means that all of these companies have to have an export button. And I think this is, and so if you dig around in like the LinkedIn or Facebook preferences deep enough, you'll find a button, which if you click it, they will email you a two gigabyte zip file full of JSON. Um, which for most people isn't useful, but if we can work together to build these tools to convert that into SQLite, that suddenly becomes accessible to people. The LinkedIn one, and the, the, the most fun data you get out of them is your ad targeting. You find out that LinkedIn have categorized you as this particular type of, um, of engineer or executive or whatever so that they can sell ads against your profile. Um, so, but I, I generally, I, I love that this stuff is available. I think it's really exciting to be able to pull it out, dig around and see what you can Figure, figure, um, figure out from it. Can you do queries with joins between data sets? Yes, you absolutely can. At the moment, they have to be tables in the same SQLite database. Um, and actually, I've got, I can show one quick example of this. Um, so I've been publishing COVID-19 data from the New York Times and John Hopkins and the LA Times. And um, they publish data by the US county, at the US county level. And then I realized that the US census publish a um, county populations um, numbers. So for the county with this FIPS code, how many people live there? So I've got a view here, which is a SQL query that joins US census data against New York Times data and can show me which county in the US has is the worst in case of cases per million. It's Trousdale County in Tennessee, which it turns out is home to a, a really big, I think it's a big federal prison there. Um, but yes, yeah, so this is a great example of how once you've got this stuff, um, in, in, into these databases, being able to join stuff together lets you come up with all sorts of really interesting um, extra, uh, extra, extra bits and pieces. So I think, I think we are out of time. Um, I'm going to keep on taking questions until somebody, until, until I get cut off. Or am I being cut off? Here we go. Oh, hang on. I think you're muted. Um, too. Oh, too. Oh. Oh. There we go. The You're 20 unmuted. point call of, call of the everything. Thank you so much, Simon. That was great. Uh, uh, normally, normally I'd be asking you some of the Q&A, but you've already saved me that trouble. So thank you for your extra generosity. Uh, and, and I think, I think what we're, we're going, going to do now is have a little bit of a moment before we have our next speaker come on, Tanya Allard. So uh, grab a very quick snack. <laughs> 